let's take a look at the RTX 4070. It's a card that managed to surprise me in more ways than one. Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something I missed. I can't cover every aspect of the 4070 over the course of a single video, but I figured discussing some performance benchmarks and then taking a look at it from a broader perspective would be the most interesting way to go about presenting this information. Without anything else to add, let's dive into the test system. To test the 4070, let's throw it in my personal system, an i7-14700K base build sporting a Gigabyte Aorus Pro AX DDR4 motherboard. This chip is probably a bit overpowered and can fully max this card out at 1080p, but when it comes to the settings and resolutions likely to be used in the real world, it's actually a pretty decent pairing. To keep everything fed with data, we've got a 64GB pool of 3600 mega transfer per second DDR4 along with the TimeTech Gen 4 NVMe SSD to store all of our games. This will definitely prevent bottlenecks on the memory and storage side of things. It's overkill, but it's what we need to isolate the performance of the GPU in this system. Other specifications of the test system are in the description, should you wish to replicate these tests. Let's dive into how the 4070 performs. The traditional first benchmark on this channel, Apex Legends, performed very well especially considering we're using the high graphics settings and ultra textures. With an average and 1% low of 277 and 183 FPS at 1080p, the card provides ultra competitive performance, probably more than enough for even the most seasoned Apex professional. 1440p saw the average and 1% low performance figures drop to 205 and 163 FPS respectively. 4K even returned beyond playable and competitive performance, with the average coming in at 136 FPS and the 1% low at 101. If you want even more frames than what we've achieved here, then you could lower things a few notches, but considering this is a more expensive card, I figured I'd make the pixels look more pretty than I would usually test at. Crisis Remastered, a CryEngine game built on DirectX 11, performed very well at all resolutions tested without any of the fancy ray tracing or AI upscaling enabled. With an average and 1% low of 344 and 168 FPS at 1080p, the 4070 pushed out a beyond adequate amount of frames to enjoy this game on most high refresh rate monitors. 1440p saw average performance degrade down to 239 FPS on average and the 1% lows jumping down to 155. 4K saw everything drop down quite significantly, but the average of 143 and 1% low of 106 paint a picture of a game that's still beyond playable in literally all scenarios. Would I pick up a 4070 to play through Crisis Remastered? Well, probably not as it's kind of overkill to run it, but if you're going to play this game on this card, you can take solace in the fact that the card barely breaks a sweat when running the game, at appropriate settings of course. Counter-Strike 2, an eSport title also built on DirectX 11, saw the 4070 push performance that is beyond competitively viable at all resolutions. In fact, it looks like there may be a bottleneck at 1080p with this processor, but if you really wanted to push the system a bit further, the settings can be dropped to accommodate. With an average and 1% low of 353 and 130 FPS at 1080p, we're definitely CPU bottleneck, but not super severely. 1440p only dropped to an average of 331 and a 1% low of 132, showing that this card has the chops to tear through 1440p workloads. Even 4K, which this card has been capable of up until this point, returned an average and 1% low of 217 and 94 FPS respectively. This remains beyond competitively viable, and while I would generally game at 1440p to get the most from the card, you can definitely turn the resolution up and the 4070 can accommodate. Cyberpunk 2077, a first-person open-world dystopian shooter, performed pretty well at 1080 and 1440p, but definitely started to fall apart at 4K. We're testing at the medium settings with the texture set to the high setting, just to utilize the 12 gigs of memory that this card sports. You could realistically turn a lot of the settings down to the lower lowest preset, but for testing, things were smooth for the most part. With an average and 1% low of 129 and 84 FPS, the card returned some of the highest and smoothest performance I've ever seen from this game. Even moving into 1440p, the average of 99 and 1% low of 72 are a strong showing for this title on any piece of hardware. 4K sort of took a step backwards, 
Returning an average and 1% low of 45 and 37 FPS, this is still playable, but you may want to turn on DLSS to gain some frames. Up next is Doom Eternal, a first-person shooter on the id Tech engine written using the Vulcan API. This game performs excellently at the Nightmare preset with ray tracing on and DLSS set to quality. 1080p return an average and 1% low of 306 and 237 FPS respectively, which is crazy when you think about how other AAA titles run. 1440p saw an average and 1% low of 238 and 196 FPS, which remains very playable and you'll be able to hit all of your shots with relative ease. Even 4K returned a very playable 140 FPS average and 118 FPS 1% low, making me comfortable recommending the 4070 if you're wanting to get into this game and potentially the upcoming Doom game coming in the next year or two. Doom Eternal is an example of excellent performance and visuals, and it's crazy what levels of performance and tech were able to achieve with the beauty of this title. Fortnite, an Unreal Engine 5 title using the DirectX 12 backend, performs very well in the 4070 at all resolutions tested. At the medium preset with ultra textures, the card is able to render over 293 FPS on average at 1080p, with the 1% lows dropping to 147 FPS. Even 1440p saw the 1% low drop down to a similar 141 FPS, hinting at a CPU bottleneck in this build at 1080p. 1440p though achieved an average of 254 FPS, with 4K returning an average at 1% low of 140 and 88 FPS respectively. Fortnite runs very well on this GPU, and the fact that it doesn't need DLSS to reach ultra competitive frame rates makes me comfortable recommending this hardware if you want to play this game casually or competitively. Helldivers 2, this time at the high graphics preset and without any upscaling, achieved very playable performance at all resolutions, even though 4K may be a bit lower than what I'd like. Returning an average in 1% low of 142 and 108 FPS at 1080p, things felt very smooth and responsive on this GPU, and all with the card drawing just shy of 200 watts. Even 1440p saw an average in 1% low of 101 and 88 FPS respectively also showing that this card has what it takes to render games at higher resolutions. 4K chugged along with an average and 1% low of 55 and 50 FPS respectively, and while the fidelity of the bugs are great at this resolution, the performance takes quite a hit, probably needing DLSS as a consequence. Overall though, Helldivers 2 runs pretty well in this system with this GPU, and the fact that it struggles at 4K is more a testament to the advanced bug rendering capabilities of the 4070 than anything else. Modern Warfare 3 and Warzone 2 I have lumped into the same test because they perform very similarly, and at the basic preset with high textures, the game was very playable at all resolutions. Returning an average and 1% low of 246 and 161 FPS at 1080p, the card definitely has some overhead to raise a couple of settings. 1440p could also pass as a high refresh rate experience, coming in with an average of 174 FPS and a 1% low of 138. The performance at this resolution is pretty incredible, and even jumping up to 4K, the average of 92 is nothing to sneeze at. But take a look at the 1% lows and that's where the card starts to buckle under the weight of this many pixels. If you're hell-bent on playing at 4K, then turning on DLSS would improve your overall frame rate and responsiveness, but sticking to 1440 or 1080p is probably where I'd cruise with this card because the frame rates are so butter smooth. Overwatch 2 is one of those games that will probably perform well no matter what you're running it on. And at the high preset, the 4070 crushed all resolutions and returned high refresh rate results. Achieving an average and 1% low of 345 and 213 FPS at 1080p, the card is absolutely overkill for this resolution of the game. Even 1440p saw the card hit 222 FPS on average and 135 FPS on the 1% lows, showing that the card has the horsepower to tear through this rather simple title. 4K saw the largest hits to performance, coming in at 118 and 97 FPS for the average and 1% lows respectively. You might want to use an upscaling technology with this card at 4K, but based on the performance numbers you probably won't need it, and you'd have a more than enjoyable time just rendering in native resolution anyways. The final game in our test suite is built on the Vulkan API, and the fact that it's running like this is a testament to both the optimization done by Rockstar and the Vulkan API's implementation. Red Dead Redemption 2, Rockstar's classic western shooter built on the Rockstar Advanced game engine, achieved absolutely phenomenal performance at all resolutions. 
1080p saw the best performance by far, achieving an average in 1% low of 170 and 122 FPS. Moving up to 1440p though, and the 4070 comes in with an average in 1% low of 140 and 111 FPS, showing that the 4070 just has more overall grunt to render and shade triangles with, even though it's weaker in some areas than hardware. Jumping up to 4K and the 4070 returned an average of 77 FPS, which is still impressive, but the 1% low of 66 really sealed the deal as to how smooth the game felt. DLSS could help make the game feel and look a bit more fluid if you're on a high refresh rate monitor, but if you're like me and 60 FPS is fine, then this setup is hard to beat at this resolution. Overall, the 4070 has surprised me in both the power efficiency and performance categories. Requiring only a single 8-pin PCIe power connector, the card has an out-of-the-box TDP of 200 watts, but this can be pushed to around 215 watts without any sort of issues from the connector or motherboard. While gaming, this card behaves a lot like my old GTX 1080 did when overclocked, sitting at around 130 to 200 watts under load, only hitting the higher end of about 198 watts when under extended stress tests, like when rendering using Blender or some other graphics intensive code. The heatsink on this card, while it does look small when just taking a look at the thing head on, it's actually very dense in terms of fin and heat pipe layout, giving the sink tons of surface area to dissipate heat with. The board on the card is also shorter than a typical stock GPU PCB, meaning that the third fan acts as a pass-through, giving even more unobstructed cooling capabilities for the dense heatsink. Temperatures on the GPU die have never exceeded 74C, and even the GDDR6X, which is clocked at a very aggressive 21 gigabit per second, only hits 78 Celsius when under constant load. Under typical load scenarios though, the card usually hangs out at or under the 60C mark on both the die and memory which is better than I was expecting considering how small the card is. Based on the benchmarks discussed in this video, the 4070 falls behind a base RTX 3080 10GB by around 10% in worst case scenarios, but typically around 3-5% on average, making it hard to justify purchasing this card over the 3080 when both enable similar experiences. The 3080 can be found in the US for between $350 to $400 used while the 4070 can be found for $500 used. This to me, at least, makes really no sense, as the 3080 is just faster in most games by a few percent. The only thing the 4070 has going for it is the improved power efficiency and 2 extra gigs of VRAM. In fact, the 4070 is significantly narrower than the 3080 in both the compute and memory bus configurations. Coming in with a 21 gigabit per second 192-bit GDDR6 memory bus, allowing for just over 504 gigabytes per second of bandwidth to the GPU on board, this isn't anything to sneeze at, but it's just behind what cheaper Ampere cards offer. Meanwhile, the 3080 features a much wider 320-bit GDDR6 interface that's clocked slightly lower at 19 gigabits per second, equating to just over 760 gigabytes per second of bandwidth to the GPU. The 4070 also only has 64 rasterization operation pipelines, as opposed to the 96 found in the 3080 10GB, which will limit the card a lot once we turn up the resolution. Granted, the entire render pipeline in this card is clocked much faster than the 3080, but the fact that it's this much narrower means that it loses a lot more performance when you start to power or clock limit the thing. While this may seem like it would cause the 4070 to just perform worse overall thanks to the narrower render and memory configurations, the cache situation has changed significantly when making the jump from Ampere to Ada. While both architectures offer 128 kilobytes of general purpose level 1 cache per SM, along with a dedicated 64 kilobyte block of texture cache, the 3080 only features 5 megabytes of level 2 cache, while the 4070 makes use of a whopping 36 megabytes of L2. This doesn't quote unquote make up for the narrow memory interface, but it does help maintain high IPC in the GPU by allowing the cores to fetch data locally in a couple clock cycles instead of going over the much higher latency GDDR6X. At stock clock and power settings, both the 3080 and 4070 offer similar compute throughput figures, with the 4070 offering 29.15 teraflops of FP32 and FP16 compute throughput along with a supplemental 455 gigaflops of FP64. Meanwhile, the 3080 sports 29.77 teraflops of FP32 and FP16 compute, with a slightly stronger FP64 compute engine allowing for just over 465 gigaflops of throughput. 
The fact that these cards have similar on-paper floating point performance is a testament to how much faster the 4070 is clocked. While the 3080 features a heavily cut down GA102 die, featuring 8704 CUDA cores across 68 SMs, the 4070 features a slightly cut down 8104 GPU die, featuring 5888 CUDA cores across 46 SMs, giving the 3080 an additional almost 3000 extra cores to run computations with. It's impressive that the 4070 is able to make up for this lack of additional circuitry by clocking what it has so much faster. Where the 3080 has a base and boost clock of 1440 and 1710 MHz, the 4070 comes in with a much improved 1920 MHz base clock and 2475 MHz boost clock. This particular card clocks up to just shy of 2800 MHz in almost every piece of software under load. So in reality, this thing is cruising for a bruising with a cool over 32.5 teraflops of ADA computational horsepower at real-world clock speeds. In most games, backed up by benchmarks, I found that the card can run native 1080 and 1440p very comfortably at competitive to ultra settings. Jump up to 4K and now it may start to need a settings adjustment or DLSS. But things still perform very competently if you know what to adjust. I personally use this card to power both a 4K 60 and 1080p 180Hz display without any sort of hiccups. At 1080p, the card can easily hit 180fps at medium to high settings depending on the title of course. It could also pretty easily hit 60fps at the same settings with DLSS on quality at 4K. The card has never not been able to power through what I throw at it, which is impressive considering the card is only drawing about 200 watts under the most intensive of workloads. Is it worth considering this card in mid to late 2024? Well, if you're looking for just this performance level and don't really care about the efficiency or memory capacity, then the RTX 3080 10GB is about $100 cheaper and provides an identical if not slightly better experience over the base 4070. The math changes a little bit if you're looking at the 4070 Super, but honestly not that much because the card is a decent bit more expensive than the base model depending on your region. If power is a big concern and you're wanting to put the card into a physically smaller build, then the 4070 offers incredible performance for the power and size of the thing. And while it is more expensive, for the price you're getting a more advanced GPU die which enables a much more impressive power envelope. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think about the 4070. Does it meet your performance expectations, or would you rather get something of a similar power level for a little bit less money? I'd be curious to see how the RX 7800 XT stacks up, as well as how the slightly newer RTX 4070 Super would compare. That's all I really have to say on the matter. So thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.